I'm here with Chris, who I met at the last Dream Conference in Oregon, which was an amazing experience, by the way. We were chatting at the lunch table about your presentation, which we're going to get into today. I think it's a really great topic. Funny enough, I actually had a dream last night that we were doing this podcast, and I guess it was like a stress dream because everything was going wrong and I couldn't get the lights. <laughs> There was distractions and I couldn't get my internet to work. So thankfully we're here and we made it. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. I often have these dreams or synchronicities right before I'm doing a talk that uh, I don't know what it is, but it seems to attract them. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I guess when something's important to us, we don't want mm -hmm. it to go wrong. And then our dreams are kind of like, oh, but what if you're late or what if you mess up? Right. Thankfully, everything's good. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talking today about counterparts and dream characters, which, you know, is a very good topic because I get a lot of people talking about this and asking me about this. Um, I notice a lot of times we'll have different perspectives of our dreams. Sometimes we dream as ourselves. Sometimes we dream as a different character completely or a different lifetime. And people always wonder, is this a past life or parallel life? Um, and then we have, you know, all these questions about dream characters like, why do I dream of this random person I have never even talked to or this random person from my high school that I don't talk to? And right. this happens a lot. Um, and so I'm hoping to get some of these questions answered by your presentation today. Terrific. Well, if nothing else, I hope to, you know, maybe motivate people to pay a little bit more attention to their dreams and explore some of these dream characters in greater depth, uh, because I do think they have a lot to tell us. All right. Well, great. Yeah. So I called this presentation Meeting Yourselves in Your Dreams, an exploration of soulmates and counterparts. And as you mentioned, I gave this talk at the International Association for the Study of Dreams. But I really enjoy talking about this topic. And I'm happy to share it with your audience as well. So let me jump in and talk a little bit about you know how I got interested in this topic. And it really it, it evolved from two odd experiences. One that you sort of described a little bit in the intro is that there is a diversity of me in my dreams. You might think uh, you expect to dream of yourself as you know yourself in physical life, but I've found that I'm only sometimes Chris Conniff, who is, you know, six foot two, who's uh, 52 years old, who's a Caucasian male living in, in the United States. That is who I am typically in my dreams. But I've found upon study that I'm often someone else. So for instance, I've had several dreams with mirrors. In one of them, I was walking down a hallway of a hotel and I looked in the mirror and I saw a person with dark hair. And when I examined the mirror image more carefully, I saw that my face had Japanese features. And so the reaction is, well, who the heck is that guy? Uh, that's reflected back to me in my dream. I've had other mirror type dreams where I look in the mirror and I see someone looking back at me that's much younger than me. So there's this certain like odd feeling of why is this much younger person looking back at me in my dream? I've had dreams where I'm a woman. Uh, so a fun example of that is I had a dream once where there was something that looked like a meteorite coming down toward the planet. And I had the intuitive understanding that I was a woman and that was my husband returning, hopefully in the meteorite, sort of like from the original Superman movie when that's how Superman gets to the planet as a child, you know. And there's two other women there, and we're all very eager to see this meteorite arrive. It, it sort of arrives like a space capsule. It crashes into the ground, and then we run over to it. We open it up, and it's actually the husband of one of the other women, and she's all excited, and I'm all disappointed. So I clearly, in that dream, I'm a female, and I'm expecting my husband. So I'm definitely not always a male in my dreams. Another interesting example is sexual orientation. Sometimes I am gay in my dreams. Um, this is interesting. I had a, a dream once that what I would call like a multi-level dream or a dream within a dream. And in this dream, I am dating a guy and the guy bears some resemblance to Ryan Reynolds, funny enough. I am realizing that this guy just isn't into me that much anymore. And I'm having sort of to deal with this situation of what do I do about this relationship? And at the same time, I'm having that dream. I'm aware that I'm also in a bedroom with my wife from this life. And this turns out to be another dream I later realize. 
And I'm aware simultaneously of the two dreams going on because I'm concerned that my conversation with the Ryan Reynolds guy, that my wife might overhear the dream conversation and I don't want to wake her up, right? So I eventually defocus on the, uh, the dream with the Ronald Reynolds guy and I focus on the, the one where I'm in the bedroom with my wife. And she starts asking me very earnest questions about my relationship with this guy and almost giving me advice about the relationship and how to act. And it's not like I just woke up from a dream and it's, and it's gone. She's speaking to me as if this is like an ongoing situation and I need her advice, you know. And then I wake up from that dream and then I'm back in this reality. I'm back in what we we commonly think of as physical reality. And so that that dream is sort of interesting on many levels. It shows sort of the multi-level or multi-dimensional nature of dreams and possibly also physical life. Uh, but it also shows, highlights again, the idea that I'm not always the heterosexual male that I am in this life. You know, another example would be looking at your profession. Uh, I used to be an attorney. I haven't been an attorney for 20 years, but I still have dreams where I'm an attorney. When I practiced law, some of those years I was in New York City. And so I still have dreams of that time living in New York as if I'm still practicing law uh, in New York City, as if that's something that's something somehow ongoing on some level. So, so that's a big topic, you know, the diversity of myself in my dreams. How often are you aware of your current personality as Chris when you notice that you're this different, fully immersed in yes. these other personalities? I'd say most often I'm immersed. I would say there's probably been a handful of occasions where that's been a lucidity cue. So I've been able to trigger a lucid dream because of realizing that something is off here or this just doesn't seem right. But in most of my dreams like this, um, I'm not aware. You know, I'm just sometimes I'm confused. You might say some of these become what some people call pre-lucid dreams, where you're on that, that cusp of questioning things. You're wondering what's going on, but you don't quite trigger that full lucidity of realizing it's a dream. The, the second odd experience is the idea of the unexpected recurring dream figure. And this is uh, the idea that we would normally expect to dream frequently about our close friends and our family members. Certainly, if you have a spouse or significant other, you would expect to dream about them quite often. Or um, if you have a lot of regular interaction with a coworker or something like that at work, that you might expect to dream about them. But what about the times when you dream about these figures that you do not have any ongoing really relationship with? Um, and I'll add another layer to that, that I found some of these dreams with the unexpected recurring dream figure, they also have symbolism that is suggestive of intimacy or connection. And so I began to take note of that. And I'm going to go ahead and just introduce one of my potential counterpart. I'm going to use a fake name just for privacy reasons. And I'm going to call him Keith. And Keith is one of the reasons why I got going down this path. Uh, and I first started noticing this trend all the way back in 2012, which was at that point, I was probably a couple of years into my getting more serious about dream work. And I was a regular dream journaler. And I noticed that over the course of a nine month period, I had seven different dreams about Keith. And Keith was a business acquaintance. He was someone who I don't really have a friendship with. I'd say we're friendly, but I don't really have a friendship with him. And yet he kept recurring over and over again in my dreams. And those are just, of course, in the dreams that I recorded in my journal. And potentially there were other dreams that I didn't record that he was in. And so we're going to explore some of those dreams as we go on here. Um, but you tell me, tell me uh, I'm gonna, do you have any experience like this of yourself where you are unexpectedly dreaming of these people? Yes, definitely. And it leads me to wonder why. Right. Because if I have no strong connection with them in waking life, why are they appearing in my dreams? And it makes me wonder if they ever dream of me too. Right, right. So I'm going to introduce sort of a theory that might help explain some of this stuff. I've got a slide up for those of you that are tuned in on YouTube, uh, introducing Jane Roberts and the Seth material. And it requires a little bit of explanation because it's an unusual body of work. Jane Roberts was a channel and she spoke while in a trance state for a non-physical being that identified himself as Seth. And there's a whole body of, of books by Jane Roberts that talk about the Seth material. But Seth was uh, one of the teachers that tuned me into the idea of thinking more in multidimensional terms and introduced the word counterpart to me. I had not heard that word before. I'd heard the word soulmate. And 
I want to think of counterparts or explain counterparts as an expanded idea of soulmates. We tend to think of soulmates in the romantic context, that someone is my soulmate. And sometimes we'll think of soulmates also in other contexts, like a parent-child relationship. You may sometimes say that they're a soulmate. But the Seth material introduced me to the idea of counterparts, which is an expanded idea that says your soulmates may be much more numerous than you realize. One of the quotes from Seth is that a group of cells forms an organ, but a group of selves forms a soul. He says, I'm not telling you that you do not have a soul to call your own. You are part of your soul. It belongs to you and you to it. You dwell within its reality as a cell dwells within the reality of an organ. So there's this idea here that you are part of a larger entity. You can think of your soul as having uh, many different elements to it. Um, and Seth says that you quite literally live more than one life at a time. And this is also expanding on the idea of reincarnation. Some people that are open to reincarnation think I might live a series of lives in different centuries, say, and I can understand or get my mind around that. Counterparts is an expansion of that idea and says, not only do you uh, live multiple lives, maybe in different centuries, but you also share centuries or share decades with other aspects of your soul. He further went on to say that some of your counterparts' memories and experiences will appear to you in your dream state and that the dream state can be a, play where you, a place where you can, so to speak, compare notes. You could compare your experiences. And finally, he encouraged people to discover your own counterparts, to do the research, to study your dreams and to study some of your waking life experiences as well as well and see if you can't identify who some of these counterpart relationships are in your own life. So that's something that we're going to explore with some of the examples I have coming up. Um, and then finally, just a little bit from Jane Roberts herself. Jane, in addition to channeling that material, she also authored several of her own books. And one of her metaphors that she offers is the idea of what she called a multidimensional Ferris wheel. And this is just a metaphor for thinking about the nature of the soul and its many counterparts or aspects. Um, and you can imagine a, a Ferris wheel with each bucket on the Ferris wheel being a different personality or a different aspect. And that the soul might be at the center of the Ferris wheel, might be at the hub of the, of the Ferris wheel. Another metaphor that might be useful in this respect would be to think of like if you were at a sports bar and you're looking at a bank of TVs, that you, um, you could potentially observe all those televisions simultaneously. And they could all be taking place at once. And you can shift your focus back and forth, but they are really all taking place at the same time. I've had uh, interesting dreams and out-of-body experiences where I saw something like that, and it was all these TV screens just like that. And oh, each funny. screen represented like a different life or like reality. Yeah, and, and I've, I, I know many lucid dreamers have reported experiences of um, simultaneous dreams. Where in, and I sort of gave that example earlier where I had the one dream where I'm with the Ryan Reynolds guy and then another dream where I'm with my wife. And I was aware simultaneously of both dreams. And I could sort of decide in the moment if I was going to give more of my attention to one or the other or to sort of straddle them both. So yeah, I do think that's useful as a way of thinking about it. All right. So I want to jump in and talk about like, let's get that. You know, there's the old saying, you know, there's a difference between the map and the territory. So I think Seth, and Jane Roberts, they give us this map of what counterparts are. And then the territory is more important. The territory is actual life experience, actual dream experience, and seeing what you dig up as you, as you study those experiences more carefully. So one thing that I've found with my counterpart or potential counterpart experiences is that there are some common dream hints. And we're going to go over four different types of dream hints. The first one is the idea of sharing restricted or intimate spaces. So if you have a dream with an unexpected dream figure, and you're like, what is this person doing in my dream? And you find yourself sharing intimate space, that could be a pretty good clue that they have potential as a, to be one of your counterparts. So certainly I pay a lot of attention to bedroom dreams. Some people get a little freaked out if they have a dream and they're sharing a bed with someone that they don't expect to be in bed with. And they may jump to the false conclusion that the bedroom you know, only symbolizes, for instance, a sexual relationship. Bedrooms or beds 
uh, can represent intimacy in a general way because we, we often share beds with people we're intimate with. Sometimes entire families will share a bed, you know, have the kids in the bed. Some people have their dogs or their cats in the bed with them. And so it gen generally rents, you don't share a bed with, unless you're intimate with someone or have a close connection with someone. So many of my counterpart, potential counterpart figures have appeared in dreams where I'm sharing a bed with them. Uh, but other practical examples would be sharing, for instance, a small office space. So I have, a, uh, for those that are on YouTube can see, I have a picture of a, a shared office space. And I have, uh, I want to go back. I gave that example earlier of, uh, I'm calling this person Keith. And Keith and I, again, are business acquaintances. We don't really have a, a strong friendship. But I had, among those dreams, I had a couple of dreams where we shared office space. And in particular, one of them, we had our desks facing each other, face to face. And then in the dream, he went to the wall and there were two bookshelves and he labeled one with his name and he labeled one with my name. So there's this odd element of sharing a tight space and there's this double or mirroring element as well, which is another dream hit we'll be getting into. I have, I have an image of a Bob's slide for those of you on YouTube. I had a, a dream with, uh, I'm going to call this uh, potential counterpart, George, not his real name. But George is someone who I knew as a kid and in through my early years into my early 20s. But I've really not had any meaningful connection with him for the past 30 years. Yet he does commonly appear in my dreams. He's one of my most common dream figures. And in this example, we're sharing a bobsled, which is sort of an unusual, I don't bobsled in my normal life, of course. But you, of course, when you're in a bobsled with someone, you are compacted in very tight. So that tight space, again, is sort of a hint that it could be a potential counterpart connection. Bathrooms are often very tight, intimate spaces. You don't have a lot of room to maneuver often in a bathroom. So the same figure I just mentioned, George, I have one dream where I think I'm in the bathroom by myself. I'm getting ready to take a shower. I turn on the shower. And before I know it, George slides in behind me and like steals the shower from me. He jumps in and, and gets in there before I'm able to get in there. So that's sort of sharing an intimate space. Another example would be I had a dream once where I'm sharing a swimming lane with one of my recurring dream figures. The swimming lane, again, is sort of an unusual symbol because I don't I used to swim laps when I was you know back when I was in college or law school, but I don't really do that much anymore. And so but you are sharing a confined space. You have to be aware of the other person in your space, so to speak. And that's a recurring figure who I've had many other dreams about. I'm, I'm going to call him Peter. Uh, and you'll see I have a few more Peter dreams as well, where, where we have other sort of counterpart suggested dreams. So that's one thing to look for. I think that's probably one of the best hints to look for is sharing a restricted or intimate space. Another one, and these often happen layered. So sometimes you have more than one dream hint happening at the same time. So another important dream hint would be either the idea of mirrors or the idea of seeing double. So I mentioned George, that scene where he hopped in the shower behind me. There was another bathroom dream I once had with George where we were both shaving at the same time. And instead of being a large mirror in a bathroom, it was a small mirror. And we were competing to try to like use the mirror. We were both trying to squeeze our faces as we're trying to shave at the same time. So that's interesting because we got the confined space, you know, the bathroom, and then we have this mirror image. And what am I doing seeing this person's image in the mirror? Another thing you'll see quite commonly is with the mirroring is looking at clothing. So for example, I mentioned Keith earlier. And another one of my Keith dreams is I encounter Keith walking, you know, just we sort of cross paths with each other. And I look and he's wearing a dress shoe on one foot and a tennis shoe or a sneaker on the other foot. And then I look at my feet in the dream and I'm also wearing a dress shoe on one foot and, and a sneaker on the other foot. And it's like, well, that's funny how we both dress the same in this very odd way, right? Another example of that, I'm going to call this person Fred. Uh, in his dream with Fred, I notice he's wearing a shirt that is like a flannel shirt. And honestly, I'm wearing, to, to honor this dream today, because I knew I'd be talking about counterparts. Uh, for those that are watching a video of this, I am wearing a flannel shirt right now as I'm talking. And in this dream, I see him wearing this flannel shirt. That's the same shirt I have. And I had worn it like the day before. 
And then his wife is there and he starts, she starts to talk about all the other clothes that he has in his closet. And it is as if she's describing my closet, all the different clothes that are pretty much the same clothes that I have. So people matching up wearing identical clothes, um, that's often a hint that they might be a counterpart. Another example of the idea of double is what I once had a dream where I was on a plane and there was a woman on the plane. She was an African-American woman. And there was the idea that our our belongings had been mixed up and I was going through a bag that now had both of our stuff in the same bag. So that's an element of sharing an intimate space is sharing a, a piece of luggage. I pull out of the luggage these two cans of Starbucks double shot. And I understand intuitively in the dream that one belongs to her and one belongs to me. So that's symbolism of double going on, you know. So that can be an element of mirroring or doubling or seeing double. And then another example I'll give, again, this is just to show the creativity of how dreams can bring up this idea of double, is I had a dream once about a Siamese cat. And I was in bed and I heard this noise under the bed and I looked under the bed and there's this Siamese cat staring at me. When I woke up from that dream, I did some free associating with the idea of Siamese cat. One thing that came to my mind right away was the idea of Siamese twins. And Siamese twins is another word for conjoined twins. Some people who are physically attached, their bodies are physically attached. And for those that have the ability to see the image on the screen, you know, there's the Bunker twins or famous twins from Siam, or would now call Thailand, who uh, in the 1800s were sort of a sensation. They became very, very famous um, for being conjoined twins. And so a conjoined twin is, is certainly a symbolism of a strong connection. Um, and so in that example, like that was actually that bedroom at that time in the dream I was sharing with my wife. And so that could be a, 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 a symbol of a strong, particularly strong connection with someone is the idea of conjoined twins. So tell me if any of that makes sense and Amina, whether you think you've had any similar experiences to this. You know, there's two dreams that come to mind in particular. Um, one of them was like recent, only like last week. And it had the element of confined space. I was in like a van or like a bus yeah. with my mother. And in the back seat, there was like some random people from my school. Like they weren't even in my grade. They were younger than me. I didn't have a friendship or really much connection with them at all. Right. Um, and there was the element of twins, so to speak, because my mom and I said something at the same time. We were talking about dreams in the dream, right. which is funny. And we said something at the exact same time, like, oh, people want to know what their dreams mean. And we both kind of like said it at the same time in agreement, like a jinx kind of moment. Mm -hmm. um, so that's interesting because I know I have a spiritual soul connection with my mother, obviously, like a soulmate right. counterpart connection. But this other girl in the dream, I mean, it's hard for me to wrap my head around that I have any sort of connection with her outside of physical reality because we barely even speak. I don't have her phone number, nothing. Right. Like I never <laughs> talked to her. Right. So that's funny. And then I had another dream too, where I'm like uh, ice skating and there's like two other girls around who I don't know, just dream characters that I don't recognize in waking life. But yeah. we were all wearing the same sweater. Um, oh, funny. Yeah. And we were kind of like, uh, we noticed in the dream and then we kind of became friends and we're talking, you know, sharing positive messages to each other in the dream. But um, so that's another thing that's got me thinking like, you know, could that be a counterpart? I don't even know who they are. I don't know their names. I don't know if they exist or if they were just yes. in my dream imagination. Yeah. So I th it's a great question. I, I do think um, some of your counterparts you will know and you'll have a, you'll have the potential to have waking life interaction with them. And then some of them you, you may never actually meet. So I gave that example of the woman on the plane and where, you know, our belongings are in the same bag and there's the double shot symbolism. So that's all very strong symbolism suggesting counterpart or connection. She may simply represent another another life. It could be a, a reincarnational life. It could be someone who's living on the opposite side of the planet. I just don't know. But I do think it's, it's interesting that um, some of these symbols come along with people we know well, some with, with acquaintances some with people from our, our distant past and some that we just simply don't recognize at all. So then a third category. So we're, we're going to have a total of four categories. So this is the third one. The third one that's a common type of dream hint is dream scenarios where there is confusion about identity or there's an, a case of mistaken identity, or there might be some playfulness in the dream about identity symbols or credentials. One uh, example of this would be I had this dream where I was in a hotel 
and I have like a suitcase with me, for whatever reason, my room key is tucked in like in a pocket on the luggage. And I go to get the room key out and I notice then the luggage tag. I'm going to call this person Neil Smith, not his real name. And I'm like, why does this name tag say Neil Smith instead of like my name? What am I doing with Neil's bag, right? So name tags is, is definitely something to look for. Uh, and Neil, by the way, is someone who, again, is an acquaintance, someone who in at the time of this podcast, I haven't seen in over 10 years. Uh, and at the time of the dream, I probably hadn't seen him in five or more years. So what am I doing dreaming about him and seeing his name on my luggage tag? Another example would be passport applications. So I did have a dream once where I was working on a, a passport application. And I mentioned earlier, one of my potential counterparts named Peter, we, he's the one I shared the swim lane with. In this dream, I keep noticing that I'm wearing a name tag. And this is not the passport. I'm working on the passport application on the desk, but I'm also wearing a name tag. And the name tag says Peter's name instead of my name. And it's like, well, that's interesting identity symbol and name tag. And then the fact that I'm working on a passport application, which is another identity symbol, I think is highlighting, from, it's a message from my inner self to be thinking about the nature of identity in a broader way. Another example would be your phone. Your phone now has become something that you closely associate with yourself. Everybody needs to have their own phone with them all the time, right? We can't go too far. Mine is just a foot or two away from me right now. So I had this dream once where the same dream character or friend or acquaintance that I mentioned earlier, Peter, he uh, comes up to me and tells me, hey, someone just left a voicemail on my phone for you. So again, there's confusion of identity. Why is someone leaving a message for me, you know, on his phone? And I'd say one more example of this that's, that's a good confusion of identity dream would be I once had a dream where I was going through a drive through and the drive through clerk referred to me, not by my name, but by the name of this other person, you know, who has also appeared in some other, you know, counterpart themed dreams. So I think those are also interesting, you know, examples of a type of dream that should get our attention, especially if it occurs repeatedly. And then the last kind of dream um, to jump into, or this is a combination of dream and waking life, really is to look for experiences where you might have a telepathic dream or a precognitive dream and potentially also associated with a waking life synchronicity. I've come to understand or believe that we have these types of experiences more frequently with people with whom we have connections with on the inner plane. And so these, again, if, if someone is a counterpart, you're more likely to have a telepathic or precognitive dream about them or you're more likely to have a waking life synchronicity about them. So I'm gonna introduce another of my potential counterparts. I'm gonna call him Walter. And this was a really cool experience. I had a dream um, that didn't involve Walter. I just had a dream with some very specific imagery where I was holding up my shoe and I was shaking my shoe because it had glass in it. And I was shaking the glass uh, out of my shoe. And I had this dream on a Monday. And then a couple of days later on Wednesday, I was actually doing a real estate showing for Walter and Walter shows up on crutches. And I was like, what happened to you? Right. <laughs> I hadn't heard anything about him, him injuring himself. And he says, oh, well, I was on a boat with some friends and I stepped on some uh, broken glass. And so here we have the dream imagery of me shaking glass out of a shoe. And then I have two days later, I have this encounter with someone who um, actually stepped on glass, uh, injured to the point actually where he had to have surgery um, because of that. And that same uh, person in a separate event uh, at a separate time where I was also showing him real estate. Uh, and this is an example of a synchronicity happening with a potential counterpart. I found out about a property that was available for him to see. And I said, are you available this afternoon to see it? And I gave him the address. And he said, it's unbelievable, but I have a doctor's appointment like right next door to that property. It's a commercial property, right? So it, he already had an appointment that afternoon. It was going to already be right in that neighborhood. And so that's another example. And then a, a third example would be, and this is interesting because there aren't many of my friends who I necessarily would share dreams with, but this is someone who I know pretty well, actually. And I dreamed about him. Um, and in the dream, he was talking about train depots. 
I decided to email him the dream and say, hey, how are you doing? I haven't talked to you in a while, but I had dreamed about you last night. Um, and, I, and when he read the dream, he emailed back. He said, that's really funny because I just listed a new property that it hasn't been used in a, as a train depot in like, you know, decades, but it, at one point in time, it was a train depot. So again, somehow I had a telepathic hit or connection with him that um, showed up in a combination of dream events and waking events that to me can be a hint that you might have a deeper connection with that person. So I'll wrap things, things up and then we can maybe jump into some further discussion or conversation about this on a broader level. I wanted to end the the formal presentation of this with just with just sort of a a summary and then sort of a a, a a pretty funny story that happened right before I was giving this presentation for the first time. I mentioned a few times in this presentation my connection with this guy I'm calling Keith. He's the one who I had the seven dreams in about nine months uh, back in 2012, and then periodically over the years again. And so I was preparing this presentation when I was going to give it for the first time last year at the IASD conference. I was walking over to get a coffee and I was actually had been working at it on my desk in my office and I walked over to get a coffee. And I was actually rehearsing the presentation in my head because the presentation was coming up in a day or two. We're getting ready to fly out to, uh, to Oregon for the conference. And I walked over to Starbucks and I couldn't believe it. I, I, I crossed paths with Keith in the Starbucks. And I said, and of course, he doesn't have any clue that I think he's a counterpart. Uh, I'm not that close with him to where I would share that with him. But um, I thought to myself, that's pretty wild that I ran into him just as I was preparing this presentation. And then, uh, but didn't think too much of it. Then the next day, I was um, in my office and we had a check to deposit. In, in my business, I have an assistant and 99% of the time when we have a check to deposit for the real estate business, she takes it over to the bank. For whatever reason, I had an impulse that afternoon to take the check to the bank myself. And for those that are benefiting from you know watching this on a video format, you'll see I have a picture posted of a bank branch. I took this later. But so the day after encountering him at Starbucks, I pull up at the bank drive through, which has two lanes. It's sort of a double image, which is interesting. And uh, there's already a car in the inner lane closer to the building. I pull up in the outer lane and I want to make eye contact with the teller. So I look through the car that's on the inner lane. And to my shock, it's Keith again, who I had just seen the day before. Um, and so he rolled down his window. And we both shared a big laugh because we hadn't seen each other in a couple of years. And then here we were you know, seeing each other two days in a row. And unbeknownst to him, I'm also working on a presentation that... Um, features some of my dreams and interactions with him. So I thought that was a really cool synchronicity that happened you know, immediately in the days before, you know, the day I was first giving this presentation. That is fascinating. Yeah. yeah. I don't believe in coincidences at all. I definitely yeah. see the connection there. That's so interesting. And if it's somebody that you're not even close enough to, to share a dream, what do you do with this information that these people might be potential counterparts? Like, right. It's a good question. Like, what do you do? Is it, is it useful to have? So one of the things I've found is that, so for some of these people that are my counterparts that I'm not necessarily close friends with, in some cases, I do have actual business relationships with them that um, I find that maybe there's more opportunity for synchronicity to unfold, for things to go well, for, for me to be in the right place at the right time and for them to be in a partner on a transaction for something. So I do pay attention to it because even though I might not consider myself to be close friends with them, I do feel like because we have that interconnection, you know, there is potential opportunity um, for us to have, you know, positive interactions that might benefit us both, you know. And then, you know, what else do I do with it? I would say, you know, for me, it's part of my passion project about being interested in dreams and synchronicity um, is to share this information with others because I feel like, you um, there's a lot to discover here. Um, and it's more about self knowing, you know, you don't necessarily need to have a tangible benefit. There's a lot of benefit comes from the self knowing that you're not alone, uh, that you have a soul that has many different aspects, and that you have a deep interconnection with other parts. You know, and I really feel like on, on a much deeper level, we actually have these connections with all of humanity. 
You know, everyone on the planet is really our sister and our brother. And hopefully, if you had that realization, you might be less um, less inclined maybe to get into a fight with someone or go to war with someone uh, or get into dispute with someone if you understood that on a deep level, you're interconnected with this person, you know. And so I think it, it, it hopefully causes me to have a more positive outlook and try to find creative solutions because I'm understanding that these people are really part of me. Yeah, that's great. I love that. I always try to foster sharing my dreams with people when they pop up, even if I haven't talked to them in a while and just as a way to honor the dream and see what interesting connections come out of it. I yeah. think it's important to normalize that. And, and then it might make the other person comfortable sharing their dreams with you. And it just like has this big effect. Yeah. Yeah. So dreams are big. Um, it's a big part of my life. I, I would not have um, imagined if you'd spoken to me 15 years ago that um, I would be so excited to talk about dreams with people. <laughs> um, but uh, it started really for me as a, as a spiritual inquiry. I got interested in spirituality and Many of the teachers that I tuned into, it was, became like the beat of a drum that tuning into my dreams was an important way to get better depth of understanding about these things. Yeah, I continue to be amazed at what dreams reveal to me. So, Yeah, that's great. And now that you are interested in dreams and you're studying it and all that, what type of work do you do within dream work? Yes. Thank you for asking. So... I have a couple things going on in my life. I have, you might say, multiple interests. Um, so in my day life, um, I own a real estate business and I spend a lot of my time working with clients. Uh, and I do like that because it gives me an opportunity, as I told, as I shared with some of these stories I told you earlier, to see how synchronicities play out in a real environment. You know, uh, and real estate's a fantastic profession for seeing if you can be in the right place at the right time. Uh, or to have sort of interesting interactions. Um, and then I have uh, my side hustle, which is my coaching business. And I call that lucid coaching. Uh, I named it that because I got interested in lucid dreaming uh, going back about a dozen, 13 years ago. Lucid here in the coaching is intended to mean certainly lucid in your dreams as one expression of lucidity, but also lucid in your waking life. And this counterpart stuff is an example of that. It becomes a process of becoming more aware of the kind of environment that you live in and what's a healthy way to navigate in physical life. If it has deeper qualities that meet the eye, if it's not simply a physical environment, if it's also a psychological environment or a spiritual environment. So a lot of my coaching work uh, deals with that. Some people, I, since I have been, practice and experience as an entrepreneur. Some people do come to me for more business coaching or I call it abundance coaching. And so one of the expressions I do with my interest in these topics is I uh, am a facilitator at a, a retreat center here in the Charleston area where I live. And so I facilitate three meetups each month. These are in-person gatherings. One of them is specifically a dream circle, you know, where we share dreams and talk about dreams. And the others are where we gather to talk about things like synchronicity about what some people call law of attraction in your inner life. And so, so those are fun. But you know, one other fun story to tell you that relates to the connection between my two worlds, between my coaching work and my, my real estate work, is I had an opportunity a few months ago where I got a phone call from some ladies and they had just inherited a property. It was a commercial building that was sort of unique. It used to be a, like a telephone company building and I went over and met them and I was in the property with my assistant. We were there for about 30 minutes, just meeting them and touring the property, what have you like that. There was the potential we might get to list the property for sale. As it turned out, you know, they ended up hiring a different company and that's all well and good. And then a few days later, um, after I had met them, um, I had, um, I had a dream where, um, there was a secret door. And in the dream, the secret door was in the floor. And I just wrote that down in my dream journal, sort of an unusual dream. But an opportunity came where someone called me and asked me to uh, show them the property, a potential buyer of it. And when we went over there, we were there. 
there for just a couple minutes and he yelled out, hey, come check this out. And he had just pulled up a secret door in the floor <laughs> that was totally camouflaged. You'd never know it was there. Um, so that was a fun interplay of like, you know, uh, sort of a precognitive dream, maybe a telepathic dream, but it's just fun and playful. So yeah, so I, I'm I'm working on a few other things. I, I I have I know I have a book in me, and that's something that we're going to work on um, as well over hopefully the next twelve months or so. Um, Great. And uh, someday I want to emulate you and. Uh, think about getting into the podcast arena. That seems like a lot of fun and great way to meet and connect with other people. Yes, I love doing it. I'm here to support if you have any questions or anything of that regard. Um, I, I love it. I mean, I love talking about dreams and bringing all the different perspectives. So yeah, this, this has been wonderful. Um, and I will put all of your links and everything in the description. But if you just want to say like your website or where people can find you, Absolutely. Yeah. So the best way to connect with me is on the web. So my website is lucidcoaching.com, L-U-C-I-D, coaching.com. And you can also follow me on, uh, I'm not much of a Twitter or whatever they call it, X now, but I, you can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. And so feel free to follow me those ways as well.